We're going over uh, soul winning verses and context, uh, which means we're looking at verses that we normally would use, pretty much just one or maybe two verses, um, and we wouldn't give a whole lot of uh, you know information about the surrounding passages, and and uh, we use that in our soul winning presentations. Now this is one that. I don't think I've ever had anybody turn to the book of Isaiah and showed them this verse, but I do. it, I, it does seem to come out a lot whenever I'm uh, talking about how we can never get to heaven bec- you know, based on our works. And uh, I always talk about 60, Isaiah 64, verse 6. Look at that again. <clears throat> I say, we are... Uh, and I don't even usually quote all of this. I just say one little line in it. But we are uh, all as an unclean thing. And here's the part that I always quote. And all, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have turned us away. But usually all I do is just kind of briefly, you know, it might come up some point in the soul winning when I'm talking about how uh, our works can't get us to heaven. I'll say even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And so, uh, you know, really... It's a, you know, not a very common like Romans road, like one of the big four or five verses that we use in the Romans road. Uh, But Isaiah 64, 6 is one that I thought we would look at the context. Unfortunately, the context is just, you know, this one or two chapters out of Isaiah that we can look at. A little difficult because Isaiah is a lot more difficult to understand, you know, maybe the than some of the context that we've used in other other passages. But there's no doubt about it, this p- image, this picture of a filthy rag is a pretty powerful image it creates in your head. And, you know, I've heard different people talk about what exactly a filthy rag is, but without trying to say, hey, let's go back to commentaries and let's go back to the Hebrew or anything like that, just think about this. We're calling r- our righteousnesses, right? The best that we have to offer God we're calling it filthy rags. This is what he's calling it right there. And, and whenever we say this in our soul winning presentation, you know, so I thought about just some different things uh, that might be considered filthy rags. And some people have said that it would be sort of like this. Okay. Does that look like blood? <laughs> All right. So let's say you, somebody in here cut themselves. I'm like, oh man, you got a rag or anything? And I said, oh, let me see what I got in my pocket. And this, this pull out this rag that I've been picking my nose with, and and you know, I had a little bloody nose get on there, or something like that. And I said, here, put this on that cut. Wouldn't that be disgusting? You'd be like, man, that's nasty. I, I need something clean. I need. I mean, there's bloodborne pathogens and all, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. And so the thought of blood, even in the Old Testament, you know, this thought of being unclean, uh, you know, and and there's a lot of talk about that kind of stuff. But I I tend to think, uh, you know. Not just, uh, I mean, some of the grossest thing. I, I mentioned this as kind of like a, you know, a rag for a cut. Uh, but what about a bandage, right? Say you got something, you're gonna you're gonna put a, a bandage on something, or even a band aid. I mean, isn't that one of the nastiest things you could think of? Whenever you, you know, you're swimming in the pool, and all of a sudden you're like, what is that? A little band aid float, and you're like, oh man, clean the pool out. You know, <laughs> put some put some uh, Clorox in there, or whatever. What do they put in there? Chlorine, not Clorox. <laughs> It smells like Clorox, but, uh, you know, that's a, that's a disgusting, that's a disgusting thing. In Jeremiah, we won't turn to the passages, but twice it talks about rotten rags. Uh, you know, a rotten rag. And what they did in this case was they used these old, they're in a, uh, Jeremiah was in a jail, kind of actually down in a pit, which some have said, uh, have described as just the nastiest thing you can think of. And, and basically down in, inside this pit, this hole, and uh, I don't know how deep it was or whatever, but they said, like, let me, let's me let get these rags, tie them together, and they'll throw them down. And he said, put them under your, your armholes. That's how they call it, armpits in, <laughs> in the 1600s. Okay, so the translation says the armholes. And they'd put that up underneath there, and they called them rotten rags. Now, here's what I think of whenever I hear the word rotten rags. You ever been to, you know, a dish, a, a kitchen sink, and there's like a dish rag in there that's just kind of been left in there, and it's gotten rotten, maybe has some food on it, and it sm- that's the worst smell there is. And you can wash that and dry it, and it seems like the smell's still in that rag. It's a nasty thing, but that's what I think about rotten rag or, or just something, uh, just, just, you know, putrefying. 
putrefied. Like if I think of rotten, I'm thinking it's probably not something that's going to sustain uh, a, a man's weight and pull him out of a pit. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, just something just nasty. You're thinking about filthy rag as something just gross or, you know, maybe an old, an old, dirty, stinky, you know, something you cleaned, the oil, polished your shoes, you did all that stuff. And, and you know, you wouldn't want to go take your, your baby's face and be like, oh, let me clean your face. Rubbing, you know, oil and junk all over, smelling bad. Uh, this is, uh, th this is what we do. Now, I I'm not sticking with the context here. I'm just explaining how I would use this first. This is what we do when we say, oh God, let me present you my righteousness, right? Uh, it's amazing how many people think that their righteousness is going to get them to heaven. And you don't know how to tell them how to put it politely that, you know, hey, you're offering God filthy rags. I mean, you're saying, hey, this, I'm so good. You know, I, I rescued this animal, you know, from my backyard that was stuck in the fence or something like that. And now I'm going to heaven. And it's like, really, that's what you're going to offer God? That's the best that you can do? <laughs> I mean, even your righteousnesses are just filthy rags, you know. But I think probably the best example, um, just in my own mind, whenever I read this, and again, we haven't even looked at the context yet, uh, see if that's important or not, but look at Proverbs chapter 23. I think this is a great illustration as well. Proverbs uh, chapter 23, verse 21. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Okay, so what he's talking about there is he's saying, look, people who, uh, you know, are, are given to intoxicating beverages, maybe they have different addictions or whatever, and and uh, at the it's saying that the end of their life, you know, what this is going to bring forth, they're just going to be in rags. Talking about like the opposite of, uh, you know, you've, you've heard the, the phrase from rags to riches, you know, and uh, you, know, you think about like somebody who's got just the fancy, they're just nice clothes and all that. And then you got somebody who, you know, they're putting on the best they can, but their clothes have holes in them and they're stained and they're dirty and they're trying to, you know, but this is their, they're in rags. And that's oftentimes somebody that will talk about somebody who's wearing rags as being just a poor person, just barely getting by. Uh, but here's the thing. The Bible talks about in heaven how we're given a robe, right? And uh, Jesus even uses an illustration about the wedding, you know, that's prepared. And everybody that goes to the wedding receives uh, this, this uh, robe, this wedding robe, wedding garment, okay? And so could you imagine, you know, you come up and you're just wearing these rags and you put them on, you're like, hey, this is the best clothes I have, but they're just rags. And then you enter the presence of the king and the king's like, hey, we want this, you know, this is like a black tie affair. I mean, you come in here, you got to have the nicest clothes. This is, we really want to do this in style and, and all this. And you're, you're going through the door and they're like, okay, here's your wedding garments. And they're passing out these wedding garments. You're like, no, that's all right. I, I've got my best on. <laughs> I don't need that wedding. Gar the king's going to really be happy with mine. And it's just these nasty, filthy rags that he has on. All right? That's what I think about in my mind. This is some, of, some of the things I think about where we would offer God what we think is our best, what we think is righteousness. And he would say, even your righteousness is our filthy rags. You know, uh, the Bible says, obviously, in, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that, which we'll be doing here pretty soon uh, in this series, that, you know, it's not our works. It says, uh, not of works, lest you should boast. Okay, so, you know, if we could possibly get to heaven on our own works, we would say, hey, look how good it is you know, what I'm offering to you. Look how, look how great I am. And obviously nothing is going to be able to impress God in that way with our pride and everything. So God wants to provide something for us uh, that we could never provide for ourselves. And so I think that would be some ways to look at this idea of filthy rags. All right, but now let's look at the context. Context is, like I said, is a little difficult uh, because we're in the book of Isaiah, that's pretty difficult. And then we're just pulling a verse uh, uh, or a chapter out of nowhere, and, and it's going to be kind of hard. Uh, the book itself is kind of difficult. It covers a long time frame. And so now we're talking about, you know, there's some destruction and there's punishment, judgment, and is God going to deliver them or isn't he going to deliver them? <clears throat> so look at chapter 
Let back up to chapter 63. Chapter 63. And look at verse 15. And this is just part of the prayer. I didn't know where to start it. Obviously, we could have read the whole chapter, but at some point we got to eliminate something. So let's just start at verse 15. It says, Look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory, where is thy zeal and thy strength and the sounding of the, thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me. Are they restrained? Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Talking about Israel, like actually actual Jacob. <clears throat> o Lord, our, our father, our redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from the, 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 thy ways, and hardened our hearts from thy fear? Return for thy servant's sake. The, tri uh, the tribe of thine inheritance, the people of thy holiness have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them. They were not called by thy name. Okay, so this is what starts out the prayer. Like they've been praying in this chapter. And uh, you say, well, who's praying? Well, it's kind of hard to tell. Sometimes you think the the prophet is praying, Isaiah is praying, and sometimes you're like, well, he's praying on behalf of the godly remnant of Israel during that time who has stayed, you know, on track, or at least is grieving for the sins and wanting to go back to the Lord, whereas others are still living in sin. Uh, so here's when it comes to chapter 64, they begin praying for destruction, basically. And here's what he says. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains may flow down at thy presence, as when the, uh, the melting fire burneth, and fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that, thy nation, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things, which we look not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence, uh, for, let's see, how do I want to read here? Let's just stop right there. Okay, so it seems kind of strange, but it's almost like what he's saying is, you know, hey, why have you, remember even chapter 23, he said, why have you hardened our hearts, basically, that we that we wouldn't, won't fear you? And it seems so weird to ask God that. It's like, hey, you hardened your own heart. God is just like not giving you blessings. He's not, you know, uh, you can't hear from him and all that, but you're the one that hardened your heart. Uh, but anyway, so they're asking him that, and then they're saying, you know, oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. And he's given all this terminology, which sounds like they're asking for destruction, like bring destruction upon us so that our enemies, you know, will know that you are... Uh, you are God. And it's interesting, as you read the terminology here, it really seems uh, a little bit to be prophetic of the same type of destruction uh, that in which we're waiting for, it, that which we're waiting from the um, book of Revelation. We can see it, Revelation chapter 6. Could go to a lot of places in Revelation, but let me read a few verses from Revelation to see if the, if the vernacular sounds similar. Revelations chapter 6, verse 15. <clears throat> it says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? And so this idea of saying, hey, you know, let the mountains fall, let them uh, come down. So we see there in the terminology from Isaiah, he says, he talks about uh, let the uh, mountains, the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Look at chapter 16 of Revelation. The other thing he said in, in uh, Isaiah 64 was, and when the melting 
fire burneth and fire causeth the waters to boil. He's talking about God, like basically judging by fire, which he's been, uh, which he had done several times in history. Okay, let's go to chapter Revelation 16, verse 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon them, uh, men a great hail out of heaven. <coughs> That verse I was just kind of showing about the mountains, I guess, actually. Uh, but as you read uh, all throughout Revelation, book of Revelation, you see uh, fire coming down. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of other things. There's uh, hail falling from heaven. There's all kinds of things. But there's a lot of fire that come down. Now, I'll read another verse about that here in a minute. But, uh, but that talks about the fire causing the waters to boil. It talks about the nations trembling. You know, they're afraid, like those guys in the den saying, hey, you know, hide us from the lamb, from the day of the wrath is coming. Sounds like a lot of terminology here in Isaiah that, that matches with what we see about end times. Now, here's the thing. As Christians, we understand the day of the Lord is coming. And all throughout history, it was always coming. It's like, hey, there's enough wickedness going on. We, we know God's going to come down. He's going to judge the world for wickedness. And, uh, and here he's saying... That, you know, the day of the Lord is coming, but they're, and they're actually asking for it. Lord, just come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. But it's like, come down and just make the mountains melt and, and the waters to boil and all that. Bring your judgment. Oh, that you would do that. Make yourself known that the enemies would tremble and all this kind of stuff. The day of the Lord is coming. And, you know, it's easy as Christians to have mixed feelings about whether or not we should rejoice in the judgment of God whenever it comes upon, let's say, our nation or the, or the world. But uh, right now I, you look around at our nation and you see the wickedness and sometimes you're like, God, just bring judgment down upon. And then you stop and you're like, wait, 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 wait. I don't really want to see my nation destroyed. I mean, this is my country. <laughs> you know, I, God bless America and all these things that we've been raised with this patriotism. We're like, man, I, I want to stand up for my country. I want to fight for it and I want to make sure that it's not destroyed. And we have mixed feelings about asking God to just bring down judgment upon the United States or something like that. You know, one big thing for me and for many people is I hate the thought that here are my kids growing up, you know, my Viviana, for instance, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is really young. She's still got a whole lot of life left. And if, if these things, this judgment's going to come in the next few years or something like that, uh, you know, who is to know? how bad things are going to get. You know, I talked to him about from the book of James this morning. It says, you know, hey, what is your life? And you don't, you don't know what's on, to, what, what's on tomorrow. You know, you don't know what's coming. And so uh, we don't know what a day brings forth. So who's to say that my daughter's not going to have to go through the midst of this, like, hard persecution and all this stuff? Uh, you know, obviously, um, all Christians are going to have to go through, and I'm going to get here in a minute, all Christians are still going to have to go through this uh, rough times. Now, we don't go through the final wrath of God being poured out, but we go through, um, uh, in fact, just turn to Matthew 24. So we go through these hard times ourselves. So we don't want our children to go through it. We don't want to go through it ourselves. So we kind of have these mixed feelings about praying for the judgment of God to come. Work more like spirit, you know, keep it a little bit, uh, hold back a little bit, God. Give us a little longer. And that's, you know, that's perfectly normal. It makes sense. I think we should in some ways have that feeling. <clears throat> Look at Matthew 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, just to spare you a whole bunch of uh, uh, theology, eschatology, God, uh, you know, has revealed through the book of Daniel, and then we see it in Revelation. I mean, if you, that's where it's really revealed. That's why it's called Revelation, right? Really revealed what things are going to happen. Uh, when you read that, you find that the um, the Antichrist sets up, you know, this world leadership, and he's got all these people following him for roughly three and a half years, and then at this midpoint of this final week, Daniel's seventieth week, uh, at the midpoint. 
there is this key event where the oblation, the abomination of desolation or oblation of desolation uh, is, is set up, right? This image or whatever it is, mark of the, I mean, the image of the beast. And Daniel, the uh, prophet, made mention of it. Um, you know, it, he talked about some, uh, some things, particular things that might have been going on in their day. But we see now, and, and then Matthew 24 makes it real clear, we're talking about events that are yet to come too. It prophesied some events that are yet to come. And when you see that, this is a significant event that marks the point of some serious tribulation, what the Bible calls great tribulation. All right, Up until this, you know, persecuting the Christians was going on to some extent. Uh, you know, I believe the mark of the beast takes place, you know, where you can't buy, sell, trade unless you have that. Boy, you never could see that. How could that even be possible in our country? And now what are we seeing? You're seeing like if if not our, you know, if we definitely see other countries where right now they can't even buy anything unless they've got some kind of sign that they've been vaccinated and all that stuff. I'm not saying that's the mark of the beast, but I'm saying we now can see how easily a government can enforce these kinds of things. All right. So there's going to come this time where that's set up. Uh, but then this midpoint marks the great tribulation where he talks about how bad it's going to be. Let's keep reading. He says in verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him... Now, I've puzzled about that for a long time. Now, obviously, something in prophecy is... Something is going to take place in Israel beyond what is going on there right now, it seems to me. Because there seems to be a focal point uh, of... Jerusalem. Remember the two witnesses that are going to have uh, part in the uh, in the the final uh, the final three and a half the final three and a half years. Those two witnesses are going to be preaching in Jerusalem. So it seems like there's something significant in Jerusalem. It seems like there's going to be a temple there. That's where the Antichrist is going to set up this uh, image. Uh, it seems like there's maybe a lot of believers that are there because here he's talking to them. But at the same time, and I don't know this for sure, but you know, those that be in Judea, I mean, in the context, he was talking to specific people right there. But, you know, we've often made the application, like, for instance, when God said, go, uh, go ye into all the world, right? And uh, Acts 1.8, he says, uh, into, go, ye in, go into uh, Jerusalem and into all Judea and to Samaria and to the uttermost part of the, world, uh, of the earth. We often will make that application and say, like, well, this is our Jerusalem, right? And then here's our Judea and here's our... So, like, I don't know for sure, but the application could just be simply being, hey, just flee into the mountains because time's going to get rough. Like, basically, you're going to want to hide out for a little while until the Lord comes back because it's really, really rough. Okay, let the uh, they which be in Jerusalem flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take uh, anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them which give suck in those days. Well, why why is that such a woe? Well, how you mean you're taking care of this baby, trying to make sure this baby survives. And now, you know, let's say you're trying to hide out, and then you got this baby that's crying, and you got to make sure that it's taken care of and has food and all this stuff. I mean, it's, it, it's a little extra stress, and it's hard. Plus the fact that you have a child who is still nursing that's a young child and you're thinking man this is the end it's not going to have a lot the baby's not going to have a life woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter neither on the sabbath uh these are going to be like talk it's talking about the more difficult times to travel you know what i mean the difficult times things aren't open and and uh, uh i don't know all the implications that are being made here for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall uh, say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, pro uh, prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, we can apply this, and we do sometimes, to false prophets today, you know, and, and all through history, but I believe they're going to be specifically during that time 
where believers are waiting for the return of the Lord because they're like, wow, we're in the last days. We're in the great tribulation. And so all of a sudden there's going to be all these rumors about like, hey, we know where the Lord is. He came back and he's over here and it's saying, no, you know better. Don't believe that, right? Don't fall for it. Somebody saying, oh, the Lord came back. I mean, just like the Bible says that he would, because he says here, uh, wherefore, if they say to you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagle be gathered together. And so when he comes back, it's going to be like lightning, man. As soon as he comes, all those who are uh, who are alive and remain shall go up to be with the Lord. And so, uh, so anyway, this we have mixed feelings because on one hand, we're just like, man, I want the Lord to come back and just deal with this world and take us out of here, and uh, you know, let he who is just be just still, and and he who is filthy be filthy still, and let's just get, let's just get out of here, okay? But but we we. You know, we tend to ask Christians to talk about that with mixed, mixed feelings. Most people, right, especially I would say primarily with those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, you know, they're just like, hey, we want to get out of here before there's any rough, anything gets rough, before there's any kind of persecution or anything. Just uh, even so, Lord, just take us out of here. You know, uh, I remember so many times people in the midst of a final exam praying, Lord, let the rapture come. <laughs> Because I don't want to have to take this exam, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the way that a lot of people think. Like, hey, the Lord's coming back and boom, we won't have to deal with anything. But that's not really what we see going on in Scripture. And even in Isaiah, which is, I'm not saying this is exactly what he's talking about, but he's saying, would to God that he'd come and just show up and that the mountains would fall and that the waters would boil. <laughs> and that they're like calling him to come. But recognizing that, you know what, they're going to be in the midst of this too. They're going to be suffering along like everybody else. Now, to those who would say, well, yeah, but see, look, here, Isaiah was talking about it. Daniel was talking about it. Uh, you know, here you got uh, Jesus was talking about it. All the Christians were saying this. You know, Paul talks about it, Thessalonians. And you got uh, John writing about it in Revelation. But guess what? over 2,000 years or nearly 2,000 years and he still hasn't come back and none of these judgments have taken place. And you know, they're mocking and they're scoffing. And I believe it's just a lot like the people in Isaiah's day, you know, as the godly remnant is saying, you know, God, you know, judge us. We've done wickedly. Uh, you know, I wish you'd just come down and clean this place <laughs> out or whatever. You know, at the same time, you know, we could uh, we could do the same thing, but some people would mock and say, "Where is he then? Why hasn't he come?" Two thousand years. We've had some pretty bad times in our in our world. But look at Second Peter chapter three, and I'm gonna get back to explaining some of the the mountains melting and and what have you. Second Peter chapter three. And starting in verse three. Uh, I'm sorry. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they, are, they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be, uh, shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So it's like, you know, you keep on by faith, 
believing. And really, I'm thinking this, that as Christians that already have faith, looking at the world today and looking at, like I talked about, some of these signs that are popping up and you're just like, how do people not see that? It's like you don't feel like you really have to have that much faith to understand that these things are going to come to pass. But some people might still uh, doubt that and question that. But we can look at these things and say, look, we know they're going to happen. So I shouldn't let my affections on this world, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't let my affections be set on the things of this world. I shouldn't like desire worldly things because I realize this is all going to dissolve. This is all going to, you know, the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. You know, those mountains, like Isaiah says, you know, the, what he's calling for anyway is that they would just dissolve, right? They would just melt away and that the waters would boil and that God's judgment would come upon this earth. But unfortunately, again, we're going to have to deal, we're going to have to go through some of that. He is coming. And just as Israel waited for the coming judgment in, Israel, in Isaiah's day, we wait for the coming judgment in ours. And so I think we could follow the logic here in Isaiah 64. Let's go back to that and we'll get to our, our passage here that we're looking at in context. Oops. Isaiah 64. So now let's go to verse 4. Isaiah 64, 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Now, it seems kind of like a weird place to put that verse right after talking about how they're praying for, you know, this, this damnation and destruction upon the earth. That's what it looks like he's, he's, he's asking for. And then he says, you know, hey, from the beginning, men have not heard or perceived with their ear the great things that God has for those who wait for him. Now, what does it mean... Uh, wait, so uh, anyway, so my first point is this. We can rest assured that God is going to protect the righteous, okay? Those who are waiting on Him, uh, those who are living for Him and, uh, and, and are the godly. But what does it mean to wait on the Lord? Now, some would think that, hey, I'm just waiting for Him to come. I'm just sitting around just waiting, <laughs> right? But that's not really what the word wait means if you think about it, Right? Uh, you don't have to turn there, but Isaiah 40, 31, popular verse, it says, He that, uh, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Right? So th these are those who wait upon the Lord. So you think really just waiting around for the Lord, he's just going to give you all this strength and all that. I don't think that's what the word wait is. I mean, I think more of wait in the sense of the waiter waits on your table, Right? They're not waiting as in sitting around, but they're waiting. They're, they're, they're serving you while they're waiting, you know, to see what you're going to need next and all that stuff. So I think our time spent waiting on the Lord isn't just waiting around. When's he going to come back? It's serving and it's working for him and it's waiting on him, you know, and doing what he would have us to do until that final time comes. Okay. And people that are doing that, uh, I believe that we are going to, you know, uh, be protected by the Lord. Now, before I go any farther on that, because this might seem a little contradictory to what I just said about how we're going to also be going through some of the tribulation and all that stuff. Okay, but uh, before I get to that, let's talk about this idea that no one has seen or fully heard all that's prepared for us. Okay, look at Psalm 34. And this idea of God protecting his people that are waiting on him, uh, it's kind of confusing sometimes to me. Psalm 34, and you know, a lot of times we like to use the word like, well, God just really blessed me. And what we mean is he gave me a promotion. He gave me a raise. He blessed me, right? So God's really blessed me. What we mean is like everybody else around me was sick and it just so happened that you know, I had a strong immune system and I didn't get sick or something like that. Well, I'm blessed, right? 
You know, a lot of times we only think in terms of like, hey, what's good for me is what I think is good for me. Okay, so we got to be a little careful about not thinking that way. But sometimes in the Bible, these verses kind of confuse us as well. Look at uh, uh, Psalm 34, what did I say, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Doesn't that sound very similar to what, what I said? Like the Lord's going to deliver those, uh, those righteous. He keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. I had this conversation this morning with Miss Candice and Iola. Uh, I was like, you know, sometimes when I read those kinds of verses in the Bible, because Miss Ruth was mentioning, Miss Ruth's like in her 70s, and you'd never know it. She can run up and down stairs a lot better than I can because I got a bum knee. She actually is having a, 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 some knee problems of late, so she can't go as fast as she used to. But, I mean, she's in her 70s. I don't even know how far in the 70s. I can't imagine that she's even in her 70s, to be honest with you. But she was talking about how she's never broken a bone in her body. Now, she just recently had a fall and thinks maybe there's a fractured, her wrist is fractured. Uh, and so that's why we started talking about it. And I thought, man, you know how many bones I've broken? And I said, every time I think about the fact that I've had broken bones, I look at that verse. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, uh, what did it say? He, he all my, uh, let's see here. Uh, I have to go back and look at it. Verse 20. Uh, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. This is right after saying that, you know, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. And so it's like, hey, if you're righteous and, you know, you might be afflicted, but your bones are never going to be broken. I'm just like, uh-oh, I must not be righteous. I've broken a lot of bones. Or how about this, uh, chapter 37, Psalm 37, verse 25. And by the way, that verse was specifically fulfilled in Jesus Christ because you remember whenever they uh, they pierced him, uh, you know, and the blood and water mixed together came out, uh, that was to make sure that he was dead. Normally, they would break his bones on his legs so that he couldn't hold himself up. The way I understand it, they would push themselves up to get oxygen. And then when they couldn't do that anymore, then they'd have to go down. And when they're like that, they're kind of suffocating a little bit. And so they would push themselves up. And so what the Romans would do, they'd come by and they'd break their legs. And then when their legs are broken, they couldn't pull themselves up and they would die pretty quickly. Uh, that's what I've been told. But it does, Bible does say that they came by to break the legs and all. That might not give all those details. But, but here's the, after they, they pierce him, instead of breaking his legs, it says this was fulfilled uh, you know, this was fulfilling this verse over here that a bone wouldn't be broken or whatever. So, so maybe that's just partly what was being proph prophesied there. But look at uh, Psalm 37 and 20, verse 25. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Now, if you're going to take that literally like that, you're going to say, well, then no person who's a Christian has ever begged bread and been so poor that they had to beg for bread, which we see examples in the Bible of people that would do that. So uh, so I don't think you can take that that far. I think there's just a general principle. And again, like I said, some of it might have been fulfilled uh, as kind of prophetic. But I think there's just this general principle saying, look, God is going to take care of you. Like there's another place where it says not one hair in your head, you know, is going to perish. And he's going to take care of you. He's going to see you to the end. He's going to make sure ultimately what we're concerned about is that our soul is going to be saved. We don't have to worry about ever dying, going to hell because we are his children. But even, you know, in many ways as we're serving him, he's going to make sure we can continue serving him. And so he's going to keep us from harm so that we can keep doing the work that he's called us to do. And we see that played out in the Bible many times as well. Okay. But not only that, uh, again, I think the ultimate idea here from Isaiah uh, uh, 64, what I was talking about is where he says, you know, nobody has seen, I has not seen nor ear has heard uh, what is prepared for those uh I'm, I'm messing it all up. But anyway, the who's, what he's prepared for us, I think that that would refer to basically heaven you know, or even, even the millennial kingdom. Like there's very, very little in the Bible that tells us about the details of the millennial kingdom and even less that tells us about what eternity is going to be like after that in heaven. We just don't know. And so all we can do is imagine like, 
you know, man, the half has never been told. Like you think, you know, the, the greatest place on earth is Disney World. No, you don't. But <laughs> the world thinks that, it seems like. <laughs> you think that the greatest place is, is, is you know, uh, uh, a resort somewhere by the lake or whatever, which, hey, amen, I like that too. But look, you don't even know how good heaven's going to be. John 14, 2 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. What's this place like? We want to think in our heads, well, it's a mansion, which means it's just big, huge house. You know, I don't know who's going to live with us, uh, you know, but probably the people that you hated on earth. <laughs> I hope in my backyard, I got this huge pond. I can go fishing. I can. This is how people talk about heaven. You know, oh, Grandpa Joe's up there fishing right now, and he's he's doing this, or so-and-so, uh, Bubba over there, you know, he's probably bowling right now up in heaven. Eh, probably not. <laughs> I mean, you think that's the greatest pleasure, the greatest happiness you can get because you live in this flesh. God's like, I'm not even going to bother to tell them how much they're going to enjoy heaven. <laughs> okay, I'll just let them fantasize and, 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 and try to figure out how good it's going to be. But you don't even know. Okay, and Jesus has gone, prepare a place. And he's preparing it for us. Uh, I've heard somebody say it this way. He said, hey, if it took him six days to create the earth, everything in this earth, it took him six days, and he's been preparing a place for us for thousands of years up in heaven. It's going to be a good place. <laughs> I've heard it uh, said that way all my life. Whatever the case, here's what we know. Uh, nobody knows <laughs> exactly how good it's going to be. But in the meantime, like I said, on this earth, there's wickedness. The wickedness is going to be punished. We are going to suffer with it a little bit. Look at verse 5. Back to Isaiah 64, verse 5. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be saved. Now, I thought that was interesting that it says that we shall be saved because you go back to Matthew 24, verse 13, it says, and he whosoever endureth to the end shall be saved, right? Uh, those who make it to the end, right? You flee into, you've, you, you've flown into the mountains, you know, you, you've, uh, you've not looked back, you've not went to go get your stuff, you've, hit, you've hidden out or whatever the case may be. Uh, on those final days, right? I don't think there's any reason for people to have a bunker right now and go into the bunker, but the day might be coming. <laughs> you hide out for a few days uh, during that great tribulation, and then you shall be saved. Okay, so that's, you know, the application that could be made there. But he's saying, you know, I thought it's interesting that he says, we all have sin. Here's talking about how God's not going to forsake the righteous. He's going to take care of them, uh, you know. But the fact of the matter is you can call yourself righteous, and praise the Lord through Jesus Christ, we are righteous. Okay. And, and, and if we present to the Lord works through Jesus Christ, they're not filthy rags. Okay. So, so we are doing the righteousness, which are good. It's not filthy rags, but uh, our righteousness that we do on our own are as filthy rags. And so here's what he says here in the next verse, which is our, uh, our key verse here, verse six. But we are as an unclean thing. Now, maybe he's talking about all of Israel during that time. It seems to be the main application. He's talking about all of our people. You know, you know you've protected us in a way in this passage. And in uh, chapter 63, he talks a lot about, you know, the, he goes back to Moses and to Abraham and, and how, you know, the people, uh, he doesn't give the details, but it seems like he's talking about how the people, uh, in Moses' day, they just kept rebelling and they kept mu murmuring and complaining and all that and turning away, going after idols, all the things that they did. This was the entire history of, of uh, Israel, by the way. And he's like, yet you still kept, you were still our God. You still reached out to us. You still protected us and all that. And so I think what he's saying here is we, he's talking about Israel, saying we are sinners. Okay, we are an unclean thing. There's a lot of things in the book of Leviticus, a priesthood that talks about this is unclean. You know, stay away from that. That's unclean. And so you can see why he, con he continues on to say, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, right? They're unclean. They're dirty. We think that we're good. We think we're presenting something good, some good works or whatever. But look, in our flesh, it's not. It's not worth anything. 
And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So the problem is our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. <clears throat> Just like God judged his people Israel, I want to make this clear too. Because we tend to teach what some call church replacement. Um, I hesitate using that term because it means different things to different people. But what we mean when we say church replacement, what we would mean in this context, what we mean is God has has finished dealing with Israel as a nation because of the fact that, you know, they continued to rebel against him. They continued to go from him. And so it's not that somebody who's Jewish can't be saved, of course, but it's that, hey, you know, as a nation, I'm done with you. You're going to scatter. You're going to be scattered all throughout the world and all that kind of stuff uh, because uh, you, you know, Jesus came first of all. So now he can, you know, he doesn't have to <laughs> fulfill those promises. They're all fulfilled with through Christ. OK, but look at Romans 11 and I'll explain this real quickly. And so this is why this text still applies to us. You say, well, this is, is, Isaiah was talking to Israel and we're not Israel. So this doesn't apply to us. I, I mean, I, I got to be honest, I'm sick of listening to the dispensational idea that it's like, well, that was Israel. Like God doesn't, you know, we're just, we're in the church age, the age of grace. And we don't have to worry about that. And we don't have to keep any laws and we don't have to do this. And, and it's just love, love, love. And it's just like, Hey, we're out of here before there's any hard times on this, on this earth. And they only think that because in the United States, we haven't really had a whole lot of persecution, but there are other countries where they've been, Christians have been persecuted poorly all throughout history. Okay. So it shouldn't be a surprise that things are going to get rough, get worse before they get better. Okay, and so, uh, uh, so when we talk about church replacement, what we're saying is that God's not dealing with Israel as a nation anymore. He's continuing on with the religion that started out with Israel, but when Christ came, they rejected him. So now he's continuing that on by all those who receive Christ. You know, whether originally, I don't think that this would apply necessarily to today, but originally whether it was somebody who was an Israelite, they were a Jew in that time, and then they turned to Jesus Christ and followed that religion, those would be the Jews indeed. Those would be true Jews because they continued on. That'd be Israel indeed, you know, because uh, they are following the religion that, that God uh, started in the Old Testament. So look at Romans 11, because a lot of people like to come to this verse really for both, both argument, <laughs> arguments on both sides. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles... Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches." And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root uh, and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou beareth not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. So what's he talking about? He's saying, basically, uh, you know, people get real elaborate in trying to, trying to define this. But here's what he's basically saying. I mean, think about a tree. Okay, and the tree's got the root, and then the uh, nutrients go through the trunk of that tree, I guess, and, and into the branches. Okay, now, if... A branch is broken off, that branch is, is no longer part of the tree. Now, you could 
then graft it back into the tree. You know, everybody in here knows what grafting is, right? You, you cut into the tree and you put, you know, where the old branch was cut, you put a cut in there uh, and then you stick the old branch into that and you wrap it up. I've seen that done and it, and it, and it works. You can actually graft that back together and now you've got the original, you know, nutrients going through that original branch and it's producing the leaves and all that kind of stuff. It's healthy. But you can also, in some, in some plants at least, you can all, or some trees, trees or vines or whatever, you can also take a wild branch. In other words, it didn't come, it wasn't originally from that tree, right? But maybe this other tree is dying and you say, hey, I'm going to take this branch because it's got fruit on it, whatever, and I'm going to go take that and I'm going to graft it into this tree so it can get the nutrients from that tree. And so all he's saying is that, Hey, you were Gentiles as a whole. God was dealing with Israel and he wasn't really dealing with you. Now we know by reading the Bible that Jews, uh, I mean, it, Gentiles all throughout the Bible still came to the true religion. You know, they converted to Judaism of the Old Testament. But now he's saying, look, that's not even a thing anymore. They've been, they, their branches have been stripped off and you've been grafted in. In other words, I wasn't a Jew by nationality like they were during that time, but you're still grafted into that the religion, right? God's religion. Uh, you've accepted Christ, and so you're in, in, the, uh, in the tree. So the idea is, you know, some Christians might get this idea that, you know, well, yeah, well, we're the church, you know, and, and God's not dealing with Israel right now, but, but he's going to go back to dealing with Israel and he's going to be harsh on them, but he's going to let us go. And we're just going to go in the rapture. We're going to wait for him to deal with Israel again. This is what a lot of people think as far as the uh, dispensationalism and all that, but that's not what it's saying at all. What it's saying is that, you know, Hey, he's going to deal with us because we're his children and we're going to be the ones that are going to uh, uh, bear, you know, the, uh, the pruning and, uh, and all that that, go, that goes on and the cleaning and all. And when he comes back to destroy those branches, right, we're going to endure a little bit of, uh, of part of that. So I want to show you for conclusion, um, John chapter 15, because this goes really close to Rome, Romans 11, this hand in hand. And so I feel like I'm concluding this right here. And I, I just, I feel like the idea of this text is this. God is going to protect the righteous, even though we must go through tribulation. As God's children, like our own righteousnesses, like apart from being grafted into the tree and bearing fruit because we're part of the tree, apart from that, you know, we couldn't bear anything on our own, even our, our own righteousness is our filthy rags. Okay. Uh, so even as God's children, look, we don't deserve any better than the world does necessarily because we're sinners too in the, in the flesh. Okay. Now we're going to be saved. We're going to be saved out of this world because of the fact that we're spiritually born again, but in our bodies, we're going to have to go through some of this and the, as, uh, and, and, and the righteousness that we have needs to come from, the root of the tree. It needs not to be our own works of righteousness, but stuff that we do through Jesus. In other words, we're not trying to get credit for it. We're saying, I'm only doing it because this is what God wants me to do. And so I'm doing it through his strength and his power and through the leading of the spirit. Okay. John chapter 15, look at verse five. In fact, let's just read one through five and then I'll be done. I, this is Jesus talking. I am the true vine and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will. 
and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. So as a church, what do we continue to do? Go out there and try to bear more fruit. Try to preach the gospel, get people saved. Try to serve the Lord and do what He's called us to do. Knowing that in our own selves, we have no righteousness. In our own selves, our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. So the context is actually dealing more with God's people saying, hey, my righteousness are as filthy rags. But at the same time, it still applies. It's a, it's a picture, you know, the, the filthy rags that we would present to God. Where's my bloody one? And I would present it to God and say, here, God, I've got some rags for you. And he's like, that's gross. Why would you give that to me, right? So the application is powerful. And when we use that soul winning, it's perfectly right to use it. I'm just saying in the context, it's not really talking about you know, trying to present our works to go to heaven. It's actually talking to God's people saying that, hey, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And so they're calling on for judgment to come down. Uh, they're calling on God to be glorified and to magnify himself, uh, recognizing that they can do nothing without him. And so I hope that makes sense. Um, powerful passage of scripture, powerful subject. I hope it wasn't too deep. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for salvation. Thank you, Lord, that you have provided uh, our righteousness. Thank you that you have uh, given us the, the, uh, the wedding garments, the holy uh, spotless garments that we could not have uh, uh, made for ourselves. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll help us as we go through this, uh, this world to bear much fruit for you, and to try to live holy and try to live clean in your righteousness, not in our own. And uh, I do pray, Lord, that you'd help us get right. And as we get right, I think uh, we would all agree that judgment must come upon this world for the, for the wickedness. Help us not to take part in that wickedness, but to, uh, to rather do your work and wait for your return, knowing that we'll be saved from destruction, but we continue to... Uh, to do the work in turning the, the, uh, the lost uh, to you and turning the wicked to righteousness. I pray be glorified now. Bless your word and use it to uh, enrich our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.